All right. And so I'm going to start with some housekeeping. So as folks come in, uh, they can skip the boring stuff, um, uh, format of the webinar, uh, timing and all that sort. Um, we are recording this, uh, the, the record button, uh, folks joining, you'll hear, um, you'll be alerted that we are recording this as we do with all of our webinars. Uh, it'll be posted on our website, zerowastearlington.org, which we'll be putting in the chat for folks who aren't familiar. We relaunched that website um, last year, and it has just become a real uh, vibrant resource. Uh, that's the best part about these events is if you missed it, it's okay. It's archived, and you can check it out. Uh, what I'd like to do first is read the land acknowledgement, as we do before every public meeting here in the town of Arlington. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Welcome everyone to uh, our um, uh, Zero Waste to Arlington, our Earth to Arlington, Let's Talk Trash webinar series. A um, quick little bit of uh, um, housekeeping is this will go for one hour. We are four minutes in, we have 56 minutes to go. Uh, as you can see, we have three panelists who I'll, I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, who are going to walk us through um, uh, 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 the food waste problem and how we're trying to tackle it. Uh, a couple of different ways uh, that we can keep uh, food on plates, out of landfills, um, uh, and then what the state is doing to facilitate this, not just uh, locally here in Arlington, uh, but across the state, uh, mindful of national trends as well. Uh, we will be... Um, Started with opening remarks, um, having a moderated conversation. You can put your questions in the chat. Um, we have a couple of folks behind the scenes. Uh, our great webinar team, a small but mighty force that makes sure these things run as smoothly as they can. Um, so put your questions in the chat. Um, if you think your question got buried, put it in again. Uh, we wanna make sure that we get to everything. We also do keep a list of questions that come up that we may not have been able to answer and we can follow up offline. Again, connect with us at zerowastearlington.org. Now the Zero Waste Committee uh, is a committee of 10 folks appointed, appointed by the town moderator um, and we meet once per month. Um, our goal is to educate uh, the public is to um, uh, help get people the resources they need, connect with knowledge, um, really get as more, more involved as they can, uh, they can be in, uh, in the town with regards to uh, waste diversion um, and uh, having the smallest footprint possible. Um, we meet on the third Thursday of every, excuse me, the fourth Thursday of every month. Uh, we've continued to do a virtual format, although we are discussing now when we can come back in in person. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but you can find our meeting schedule on zerowastearlington.org or the Arlington Town website. Um, and uh, come on out and get connected. You don't need to be a member of the committee, uh, a working member uh, to join our meetings. These are open and accessible to the public. All right, so um, looking pretty good on the attendees. I'm gonna jump in, Sarah, is that okay? Awesome, and I'm gonna- Sounds good, Molly. Thank you, Priya. And I'm going to stop my virtual background. No, I can't. So we're going to keep going. This is, as I mentioned, the fifth webinar in our series, Earth to Arlington. The first one that we did was called Recycling IQ, the Blue Bin Contamination Challenge. Uh, that was uh, two years and one month ago. I can't believe it. Uh, we switched to beyond recycling, divert more trash and get to zero waste. What can we do to keep things out of the landfill? We were not talking about organics at that time, although we did contemplate we would be doing it in the future as we are today. Amping up uh, two of the other R's, reduce and reuse. That's one that we did in November of 2021. Um, you know, we know that there's repair in there. We touched on that as well. Uh, what can we be doing to make sure that our goods are durable and things uh, don't need to go to the landfill in the first place? And we ended up last fall with new waste bans. What you need to know, and this is specifically around some of the, the changes like the mattress. Um, uh, um, you can't put mattresses in the curb anymore uh, that came uh, online as part of the solid waste master plan uh, last fall. And so today we are what we don't eat. And it's all about understanding the food waste problem. And I'm going to warn you from the beginning, you are going to be 
probably depressed, probably shocked about some of the, the data here, right? Um, this picture behind me is, is not an anomaly um, uh, and uh, happens all too often. We overproduce food like we, we do in many other categories of consumer products in the US. How do we approach the management of excess food and food waste for optimal uh, positive impact and minimal negative impact, right? Um, uh, this webinar, will look at the big picture. Um, we have our, our panelists here. Uh, I will introduce first Elise Springle, Food Link Director of Programs and Strategy. Um, she leads the Food Link Operations team. If you've seen over there on um, uh, Route 2A, Food Link has a wonderful new facility uh, that uh, they renovated that I believe it was an old Napa or it was an old auto parts store, I believe. Uh, wonderful repurposing right off the bike path. Um, uh, to, to do the work that she's going to describe to us. Uh, she developed a curiosity for the environment and food systems growing up on the Chesapeake Bay, watching oyster boats bringing in a dwindling harvest. Over the years, she's explored the food system from various angles, from working on farms and in restaurants to managing SNAP programs uh, at farmers markets in Indianapolis and Boston, and working for Daily Table in Dorchester, which is expanding. We'll touch on that a little bit later. We're psyched about that. Uh, Justin Sandler, after that, from Black Earth Composting. We're psyched, Justin, that you've joined us. Um, uh, he's been a, a partner since 2011, back when the company had a one beat up truck and a handful of customers, and he's witnessed the rapidly increasing adoption of food crap, a food scrap diversion, compost in Mass and Rhode Island, um, and is looking forward to expanding. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I can say, you know, 10 years in the fruits, food scrap collection um, industry, um, I, we can't wait to hear, Justin, some of the changes you've seen uh, and, and opportunities you see for the future. Uh, and finally, John Fisher, uh, bringing it all home for us, a Deputy Division Director for Solid Waste Materials Management at the Mass Department um, of um, uh, environmental protection. This is Mass DEP. Um, he oversees Mass DEP's development and implementation of the Solid Waste Master Plan, which I mentioned earlier. We'll be including a link to that in the chat a little bit later, uh, including uh, the regulatory, permitting, compliance, grant and assistance programs. Uh, there's a lot going on, John. I don't know uh, how you get it all done. Uh, and then you make time to come share uh, your knowledge with us. Thank you for that. Uh, we're trying to advance waste reduction, recycling, composting, and mass. Um, and uh, thank you for that. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to introduce Elise Springle from Foodlink to start us off with the big picture. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm very much looking forward to sharing a little bit more about our work and, and also the big picture. Um, Priya, if you don't mind putting up my slides. Um, so I'm starting with talking a little bit about what is food waste and what the impact is. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, so food waste is a huge problem and a huge uh, contributor to the climate crisis that we are in. Um, about 30 to 40 percent of the food we produce in the U.S. is wasted. Um, so think about your dinner plate and cut it a little bit less than in half. And that's all going into um, the waste system. Uh, and this is a, a huge problem when it comes to thinking about uh, the climate crisis. Uh, if food goes into um, incineration like it does in Arlington, I believe, um, it takes more energy to burn it than it would other products because of the high water content. If it goes into a landfill like we were seeing behind Scott before, uh, it actually produces uh, methane gas. Uh, which is a more dangerous greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and add this all together. And if we were to treat food waste as its own country, it would actually be the uh, third largest producer of greenhouse gases um, in the world. So behind the US and behind China, it would be food waste. Um, so if you go to my next slide, uh, the majority of the food that is wasted in the US is actually still edible. So 70 to 90%, very high level. And food is wasted at every step of our supply chain. So on farms, we're looking at food being wasted because maybe it didn't have a market. Maybe it um, was grown and it was larger than expected or uglier than expected. And so that food is often tilled under into fields at transportation and wholesale levels. It's uh, again, wasted because of market. Sometimes it doesn't uh, actually have a place to be sold. There might be transportation issues. You know, if they hit traffic and it doesn't meet the right window for delivery, uh, temperature control issues, just 
misdirected logistics issues. There's so many reasons. Uh, at grocery stores, we see a lot of waste because of code dates. You know those as best buy, sell by, expiration dates. Uh, those are not a regulated thing and they're not actually about food safety for the most part. They're much more about freshness and companies protecting their brands and uh, stores knowing when to cycle something off the shelf. So most food is good well past those expiration dates. Uh, that would be a great question for someone to ask if you want to learn more about it. I can also send resources after. Uh, and then a lot of food is also wasted in our homes. Uh, we all have things that go bad in the back of our fridge that we forget about, or we had expectations that we we're going to eat healthier. Uh, and all of a sudden we've got some oranges that are molding um, or those uh those massive portions from a restaurant that you brought part of at home and didn't get to, or maybe you left it there because you knew you wouldn't. So it's happening all over the place. Uh, and so why do I care about that? Why does Foodlink care about that? If you go on to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more. So we are an organization, we're called, we're a food rescue organization, and we're working to create a more equitable food system throughout greater Boston by rescuing, distrib distributing high quality, customized food to under-resourced communities and by advocating for, system, for systems change. So we are working to get food that would otherwise be wasted, excess food that's still edible and good, and we are distributing it to nonprofits and community organizations throughout greater Boston that can get it to people who are food insecure. We're based here in Arlington. We've been around for 11 years now. Uh, we move about 1.2 million pounds of food a year. If you will go on to the next slide, I'll tell you a little more. Uh, so part of our work is, obviously our work is about food waste and wasted food and the environment is a major part of why we're doing it, but also so is food insecurity. So in um, between 2020 and 2021, one in three people in Massachusetts experienced food insecurity, meaning they did not know where their next meal was coming from. Uh, that's a very high number. Uh, food insecurity uh, is fun is full well, food security is fundamental for our well-being uh, and food insecurity has lasting effects on people's lives. If you go on to our next slide. Um, so what we do to remedy this is we're working to connect that excess food to the nonprofits who can get it to the people who need it. Um, we are working with grocery stores, wholesalers, and farms uh, to get that excess product. We work with about 90 different food uh, donors every year, and we serve about 90 different recipient agencies. If you go on to the next slide. Um, we are different than a food pantry. And, um, you know, I think here in Arlington, um, us in Arlington Eats are often conflated. We do work really closely with Arlington Eats. They're one of our recipient agencies. So we do distribute food to them along with other partners in Arlington, like the Arlington Boys and Girls Club or the Arlington Housing Authority buildings like Chestnut Manor, Cusack Terrace and Monotomy Manor. Um, but we're also working with homeless shelters, after school programs, in low income housing facilities um, throughout the greater Boston region. Uh, and just one more slide, I think. So the way we're doing this work, we sit on kind of a three, um, a three leg stool. So prioritizing dignity and choice in our work. Um, if you were to go see the food that we were giving out today, you'd see that it's really good because frankly, there's a lot of really good wasted food in this country. Um, but we're trying to get food that feels dignified to people. So sometimes we are um, composting or sending to animal feed food that is still edible, but isn't as um, uh, appealing to people because we do want people who are food insecure to still have good food. Uh, we're also taking that home as volunteers and staff to um, to eat ourselves. So if it's like, you know, we'll get an apple and if it has one bruise, I send it out the door. If it has like half of its bruise, well, then a volunteer will probably take home two apples for the price of one or to get one. Um, uh, but we're getting, you know, 1.2 million pounds of food to people a year and we're prioritizing the things that they need and things that meet their cultural and dietary needs. Uh, we are a volunteer-based model. We have um, 11 staff members, but about 250 folks regularly volunteering with us and about 750 folks who come through our door every year to volunteer. Uh, so the vast majority of work is done by our volunteers and that's a central part of who we are because our volunteers also end up changing the ways they eat and think about food by the process of working with us, uh, which is really exciting. And then the third piece that we work on is systems change. This is a new thing for us. We just completed a strategic plan that pointed to the direction of realizing that 
while our work is really important, it's a Band-Aid in a broken system. So we're looking at ways that we advocate for better systems around food donation, about um, better ways of dealing with food insecurity. Uh, so there, that's a new thing for us. But right now we've been working on the Universal uh, School Meals campaign here in Massachusetts. Uh, and so I will turn it back over to you, Scott. Um, a wonderful overview. You can see me. Um, my hand keeps going off the screen. I'm, I'm writing down, number one, a lot of these questions that are coming into my mind, I think that would naturally uh, come into our, our uh, participants um, who are joining tonight, uh, their minds as well. But I just wanted to, to frame that top, uh, like, what's the lead here? 40% of the food uh, in the United States uh, is wasted. 70 to 90% of that is still edible, right? Um, this is, uh, it's embarrassing to think of that. And this is just the way that we've set the systems up uh, and the way that our behaviors, um, you know, uh, everybody makes choices. Uh, we can collectively change the choices that we make to make better choices and bend markets. And we've seen that uh, in other uh, webinars that we've done that I mentioned earlier that you can still get on our website, zerowastearlington.org. Um, Elise, we will come back. Thank you for that great overview and thank you for the work that you, you do. Um, Justin, can we jump to the other side of this, right? Like when there's, when it's an entirely bruised apple, when there's nothing else that we can do, the applesauce is going to cut it, no smoothies, it's got to go somewhere. How do we keep it out of the landfill? I think you're muted, Justin. Back at it. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me as well. Um, so yeah, Black, Black Earth Compost, we're, we're not the initial place where food's, food uh, scrap should go. It should go to you know, ideally human consumption and then above us is animal consumption. But a lot is gonna get through and we are here to collect as much as that as we can. We're a nutrient recycler. So we take all the nutrients that are in food scrap, we make compost and that compost is then applied back onto the ground where more food um, should be grown. So currently we, we, we haul um, and compost 300 tons of this stuff per week. We've been around since 2011. I've seen it. I've seen not only our company grow, but the awareness of food scrap, of 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 the um, importance of food scrap diversion, um, grow as well. I realize I'm no longer really defining what composting is. Also, people are more proactively seeking us out. Um, there's a tremendous amount of uh, ground level support from groups like this. Um, other volunteer groups, even students down to, you know, I did a talk with second and third graders um, about this issue. And, you know, they were asking me, they were keeping me on my heels and, uh, you know, asking, asking really uh, provoking questions that, you know, I, I wasn't really introduced to the concept until the business started in 2011. And, um, but, you know, we're doing as much as we can. We're growing throughout the state. We're, we're in Rhode Island. We, we pick up the 300 tons that, that and the source of that is, is about 32,000 32, individual residential accounts. But we also pick up, um, and that, that, that averages out to be about 10 or 11 pounds per pickup per household. And then up to a big producer would be a college or a supermarket, but we get everything in between as well, offices. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and all sorts of restaurants. Um, I'm reporting live here from our compost site in Manchester by the sea on this warm night and um, looking out on a field of, uh, field of to be screened compost. We are in the midst of peak compost um, distribution. Uh, so we are uh, screening a ton of it. The screening is the, the kind of the last phase um, to get all the big chunky material out of our compost and we get that nice fine uh, material that we sell to, at garden centers. Um, people use it in their backyards to grow healthy food um, and, and local farmers use it as, as well. And uh, perhaps some of your CSAs are actually grown out of black earth compost. Um, oh, I see some pictures are coming up and that is one of our uh, 33 trucks, I believe could be 34. Um, we have 73, we, we employ 73 um, people throughout. This is one of our, um, our ACE drivers um, going, I believe based off what the bin looks like, that might be down in Rhode Island um, with the Healthy Seas, Healthy Soil Initiative um, down in the Newport area. 
And this is, I mean, this is, this is kind of illustrative of, of how simple composting can be. You put the food scrap in a bin and we put it in our truck. Um, you know, the, the magic really happens over the next six months where it's breaking down and um, being handled well by, by our team of um, composters at, at the sites. Um, and nice segue into, this is our Groton site. Um, this is, so our site in Manchester is all outdoor composting. This is our kind of uh, 2.0 up in Groton, Massachusetts. Uh, it's on city land and they allowed us in, uh, uh, to build that nice building where the first few weeks of composting takes place in a very, very controlled environment. And that is how sharp and crisp um, we want our compost sites to look. And um, that is what we're trying to replicate. Um, they're doubling the small modular compost sites. Um, and we are in the process of building the um, 3.0 in, in, uh, across town here in Manchester by the sea um, as well. It's gonna be basically this, but just a, a, a larger 9,000 square foot building. And we are trying to um, create a replicable model that can be used throughout the state. Um, so we have, we currently have three sites um, and we're, you know, we, the, we want to have these, you know, fairly adjacent to any compost pickup routes that we are doing. And what, what is this? Oh, so, so, that, and, and this is, this is kind of everything. Um, so we have the pickups are on the right hand side that, um, that 13 gallon cart that we use to pick up residentially behind it is a raised garden bed, which we also prefabricate at our site. Um, and we can, you know, you can go out to work for a day, you place the order for the raised garden bed, you come home and you'll have the raised garden bed in your backyard filled with our compost 50-50 mix. And not only that, we, um, we also uh, team up with a local organic seedling, um, uh, organic vegetable um, company here in, in Gloucester called Cedar Rock Gardens. And uh, it also comes with, uh, you know, some vegetables or herbs as well. And um, on the other side is our uh, bag product that we have available too. And uh, here's, it looks like uh, Iron Ox Farm up in Hamilton. This is an example of a farmer um, applying it to what will soon become uh, vegetable rows. Um, we work closely and we have a really strong network of uh, farms that use our product as well. Uh, that is our goal is to bring again to, to recycle the nutrients that are already in our food scrap and, and put it back onto uh, be it farmland or be it folks uh, backyards. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of um, diversified revenue streams. I can imagine this is not an easy business to run, uh, uh, to keep going, right? And to keep growing. That really is amazing. I wonder that that aerial view, what's the, what's the acreage that that represents, number one? And what's the sort of, is it tonnage? How would you measure industrial composting material? Yeah, I believe I was just trying to get go over those numbers with with Andrew uh, beforehand, but exactly right. Uh, so tonnage per per um, per week, and I believe that site is seventy. Andrew would probably correct me and say it's seventy five, um, but I, I think it's in that realm, and I, I believe it's only two acres. So our wow. model doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, we're flexible in 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 how it can be um, managed within a city. And uh, we have a couple other prospects that we hope to um, get up and permitted and uh, diverting food scrap. Wow. So incredibly efficient, two acre spot. And this you said is uh, uh, you're allowed to use it by the town of Groton. Um, I think maybe further down, I'll ask you a bit more because I want to dig into the business model. Uh, but that is really um, a fascinating stuff. And I think you mentioned that Manchester by the Sea is going to be an indoor facility. Is that correct? That's correct. Just like that photo, but a, a larger building. And we also, uh, our current site in Manchester and the future one, will the property is still owned by Manchester. So we, we work in conjunction with municipalities. Got it. Fascinating. Um, I think before I go too deep, we're going to round it, uh, round it out with uh, John Fisher uh, from MassDEP. Um, John, what does it look like from where you sit? 
Yeah, um, thanks. And thanks for having me here tonight. And uh, just want to compliment you guys on your webinar series really quick. I had a chance to listen to one of the earlier ones and you do a really good job with it. So yeah, I think it's great you're putting these on. Um, so I could talk about this all night, So, I'll, uh, but I'll uh, make a good effort to be concise. So, you know, some of the statistics around food waste are, are really um, sobering and, and kind of troubling, but you know, there's there's also an opportunity here. You know, every time we see waste, that that's an opportunity for us. And with food, you know, compared to other materials, food is probably you know one of the most compelling materials of all to be focusing on because because of the value it holds to us. Um, so, you know, the the uh, the good news is that we've made a lot of progress here in Massachusetts. We're among the leaders nationally in our efforts to reduce food waste. It's it's thanks to uh, a lot of organizations like Foodlink and and Black Earth that are op operating around this um, around the state. We have about uh, 50 facilities across Massachusetts that take food waste for either composting, uh, animal feed, or anaerobic digestion. We have a really good, robust uh, food donation and rescue infrastructure that's really come a long way um, in in the past 10 years or so, especially for fresh and perishable foods. That's kind of exciting. Um, so we started, we've been working on food waste for, for decades, really, but we really tried to pick up our efforts back in 2012. We started working on what was then one of the first disposal bans in the country for large food waste generators. So we focused that on businesses and institutions that dispose of one ton or more per week. There's about 2,000 of those entities in Massachusetts. Uh, we implemented that ban along with a really great uh, technical assistance program called Recycling Works in Massachusetts back in, um, that program started in 2011, the ban started in 2014. And uh, since then, we we went from diverting about 100,000 tons a year of food waste from disposal to about 300,000 tons a year now. So about, about 200,000 tons more of diversion on an annual basis. Uh, when we started, we had about 1,300 businesses separating food waste for composting or animal feed or anaerobic digestion. Now we're up to 3,500. So we've more than doubled the number of businesses uh, separating food waste. Um, we did a study, it's been a while, it's probably time to redo this study. We did it in the wake of the 2014 ban, just to kind of look at the economic impact of everything that's going on here, because this creates jobs and it creates business growth. And uh, at that time, and I'm sure we've, we've come a long way since, we had about 900 jobs across the fields of food waste collection and composting and um, food rescue and donation and things like that. Uh, it was generating uh, over $175 million of economic activity on an annual basis. And there, back then, there was about $50 million of investment planned across the food waste uh, reduction uh, industry at that time. So, you know, it's not just about uh, reducing our disposal. It's, it's not just about capturing this valuable resource. We're also, you know, cr creating these valuable products in the process and creating jobs. Um, you know, you talked about our, our solid waste master plan at the beginning. That's what drives what we do from a, from a solid waste perspective. And there are a lot of reasons why it's really important to reduce our disposal. Uh, even with the progress we've made, we still, um, we still dispose of a little bit north of uh, 900,000 tons of food waste a year on an annual basis. Uh, it's about 21% uh, of our, our regular household and business trash. So still a lot of, obviously a lot of room for improvement. Uh, our emphasis has been to focus on our larger business generators first. That was our 2014 ban. We rolled out an expansion to that ban uh, that we're really still rolling out in uh, November of 22, uh, that lowered the ban threshold to a half ton per week, roughly double the number of businesses subject. And as we move forward with that, our, our focus will shift to smaller businesses and to getting more residential food waste separation going. Uh, you know, starting with the largest generators first made a lot of sense to us. That's where the programs are the most cost effective. It's also where we have the smallest number of businesses we can work with to try to really ensure quality uh, feedstocks that are being separated and delivered to facilities, which is really important. Um, so that, that's been our approach. And, uh, you know, we're making good progress. We're continuing to uh, prioritize efforts on food waste at the state level. 
uh, and uh, working, you know, working uh, really hard, rolling out grant and assistance programs as we go, trying to build our education and outreach, and um, you know, trying to take advantage of all these opportunities that we that we see in the waste stream. Uh, so it's it's exciting. It's exciting to hear at uh, least talk and hear Justin about how Black Earth has has grown and expanded their facilities over the year. Uh, that's you know exactly the kind of thing we're looking for, and that's you know it's it's work like that that's going to ultimately make these efforts successful um, in the years ahead. So I will stop there and uh, try to try to save your time for a discussion and Q and A. Well, no, John, I thank you for that. I mean, let's just put it in perspective. You said 900,000 tons annually uh, of food is still going into landfills. And we'll juxtapose that with the least mention um, that the Small But Mighty Food Link uh, recovers 1.2 million pounds, right? And so this is like really, you mentioned working with 50 groups to do that sort of recovery uh, statewide. How many more do you need? Like what scale are they at? And, and how, how are we able, how is the state uh, thinking about through its grant assistance programs, for example, to sort of amp that up. Yeah, so you know, we we have a a, a good infrastructure right now, um, and you know, we feel confident we can absorb the material at least that's subject to our our food waste disposal ban right now. Um, so we feel good about the infrastructure we have. We feel like there's room for growth, but uh as we go we feel like we we need more locally distributed compost capacity um i think that's really important uh we we still think there's lots of opportunities for uh for food rescue and donation to to grow i think the last numbers i looked at i may not have this exactly right but but over the state we're doing in the, in the neighborhood of somewhere uh, I'll, I'll use a range because it'll be more likely to be accurate um 25 to 30,000 tons a year uh, across all our food rescue and donation organizations, food banks and things like that. But, you know, there's there's more room there. And one thing we haven't talked about, and I just want to kind of uh, put a uh, um, toss something out there about this is, is one of the other stats that I find fascinating is that the average family of four wastes about $1,500 a year on food that they throw out. Um, and I, I find that stat almost as compelling as the, you know, 30 to 40 percent of, of all food gets wasted. You know, when you think about each family of four or, you know, it's basically per person. So you think about a, a couple, um, you know, wasting seven hundred and fifty dollars a year on food that's being thrown in the trash. Uh, so to me, that's a pretty compelling number. And, and we are, I think each have opportunities are in our own home to just be more efficient with the food we're buying and preparing. And our businesses have that opportunity as well. We've seen a lot of businesses implement systems to track food waste. And in the course of doing so, we're able to reduce their food waste by 50% or more. That's not even composting, that's not donation, just right in their kitchen, getting a 50% reduction in food waste. So, you know, when we think about how are we gonna get these 900,000 tons or so, and we're not going to get 900,000 tons, but we want to get a lot of it. And, um, you know, it, it's going to come from from all of these strategies across both, you know, the, the commercial and the residential sectors. No, no, truth. You remind me of home economics classes. Yeah, I'm, I'm old enough to remember we, we had to take those. There was shop and then home ec. And you learn how to be as efficient as you possibly can be. Um, and doing that uh, at the state level for restaurants and such, it's it's fascinating to hear. Um, I, I just want to stay with you for one more question because, you know, here I am, you know, asking what is the state doing for small business? What is the state doing to cover its own? Where are the feds in all this? Are there federal programs to support you and your work? Yeah, and they're 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 ramping up. Um, so EPA's funding has has been increasing over over the past couple of years, and they're rolling out more more grant programs around food waste. Also, a really important role for EPA is to um, is to provide information and do research. And if they're doing more and more of that and putting out more reports, I was actually on a call with someone from EPA this morning talking about a lot of the work they're rolling out. So they're rolling out more grant and assistance programs. They have a great program called uh, EPA's uh, Too Good to Waste program that provides a lot of resources on food waste reduction. That's pretty, uh, pretty interesting program, which has some great resources that people can use. So uh, they're doing more, um, but there's also in the Northeast, um, 
you know, it's, Massachusetts has been a leader, but uh, Connecticut, Vermont have been leaders. Uh, New Jersey and New York are following them with bans now. Rhode Island as well. Uh, New, New Hampshire, which is not typically a ban sort of state, but New Hampshire is thinking about a food waste ban as well. Uh, so there's a lot of movement in the Northeast, and uh, it's it's kind of exciting to see, you know, everything that's happening. I was on a call with my counterparts from other Northeast states this morning, and uh, there's a there's a lot of good work going on. No, it sounds like it. And Justin, I want to jump back to you if you don't mind, because Groton is stuck in my head. The municipality wouldn't give away something for free unless they thought there was real value there. So, you know, when when Groton thinks about citing uh, a processing plant like you're, you've built there, what what are they excited about most? Yeah, good. Really good point. It's the same in Manchester by the Sea, the same sort of exchange of uh, labor for land. So we take over and run what was the yard waste site. So. Um, you know, here, here I'll, I'll use Manchester, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but it's the same for Groton. The residents are still coming up with their brush. And uh, instead of it just being a brush compost, uh, which also, you know, technically is compost, uh, they allow us, you know, we take over the management of all that material, which is a lot of management. You have to grind it, which is very laborious and expensive. It's this massive dystopian grinding machine that is pretty incredible to rent out. Um, so we, you know, take on that cost. We have our loaders pushing up brush. We process, you know, anything from Christmas trees to leaves. And that's the exchange. They allow us to uh, incorporate our food scrap into that. And, but the foot, uh, another benefit the town gets is that instead of free yard waste compost for the residents, they get free uh, black earth compost, um, which is, uh, could do a sales pitch on that right now, but it's it it we we it's a top quality food scrap compost. Um, we have we do ex extensive testing on it, heavy metals um, and and uh, et cetera. We 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 have all the lab results right on our site, and uh, the towns in which we operate in with our site um, have access to that material as well. Well, yeah, and so you talk about the heavy equipment, right? Like seventy-three employees. What are what's like the range of jobs? Like, what are you? What are the folks working for you do? Um, it's really from managing. So, if, so our, our business, I guess, is kind of twofold. It's the pickups, and it, and it could be thought of as two separate, but it's very synergistic. We have the trucking um, that does all the pickups. So we have a number of route drivers, route managers, uh, an extensive. Um, customer support group, uh, you know, you have 32,000 people asking you questions. Um, we want to be able to answer them or we'll get either contaminated compost or just even more headaches. And um, so, so that's, that's kind of the trucking, but then you have to have a fleet manager and you're, there's a lot of machines to be repairing. So we have um, a group of uh, really skilled mechanics and we we're always forward thinking and, and thinking of ways to design other, other, um, you know, uh, niche uh, pieces of machinery that otherwise co might cost us a million bucks that we, we have fabricators that are coming up with designs, always tweaking, always working. Um, but then the intake of the material, we have uh, loaders and operators and site managers. And um, we and, and then we have, you know, event outreach people. Uh, it, it's, it's an extensive network. And uh, honestly, props to our incredible team. Um, Top to bottom, it's uh, it's it, we're super tight knit, gritty, creative group, and uh, super proud of you know what we built and the whole squad. No, it's great. And so you think about fleet management, Elise. I know you don't actually maintain a fleet of vehicles, but you do maintain a vast network of volunteers, as you mentioned. I think two hundred and fifty core volunteers uh, that are actually doing the moving around, picking up and dropping off food, um, very logistically intense. Um, and how do you handle all of that? I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's a great mission. But what you're both doing is intensely like meticulous. You got to get it right uh, and and dirty work, right? Yeah. So we actually do maintain a, a fleet of vehicles. We have four food link vehicles, three of which are refrigerated. Um, 
So uh, three three vans and one box truck um, to safely move the food. Since we are heavily working with perishable foods, um, it it's an important part of our food safety. Uh, and during the pandemic, we really increased the amount of perishable food we were getting, and we were getting it from further away than we used to. So we had to increase our um, refrigeration fleet. But you're right that the majority of our food actually still moves with volunteer vehicles, uh, and you know, we're actually working on some new solutions for our, our logistics. We're about, we're literally actually this week in the process of working on finalizing a Salesforce database that's going to help us with our logistics. But for the most part, we've been doing it with spreadsheets and a lot of, um, you know, we burn through cell phones fairly regularly as a result of it, um, as well of just making a lot of phone calls, but it's our, it's our staff that does that. So we have a logistics manager and a volunteer coordinator and a number of operations staff who kind of keep things smoothly running, um, of making sure that things get from point A to point B. And I didn't ask you at the very beginning, what's your geographic footprint? Are, are you town-based? Are you sort of based mm -hmm. on what's easy to get to via you know, main arteries? Like how do you guys map out what you, uh, what you recover? Yeah. So we started here in Arlington and um, you know, if you look at uh, kind of our, our regular distribution, it's Arlington, Medford, Lexington, Malden, Somerville, Cambridge is kind of our big, like our major service area, but we serve greater Boston. So we ha go as far north as Lawrence and Lowell and as far south as North Attleboro actually. Um, but most of our things are kind of centered in um, that close ring around where we are. Uh, most of our pickups are, are within there um, and we have, try to keep the distributions close by. We have a number of distributions that, or agencies that come pick up from us if we're not able to get out to them. Um, but uh, we do, we try to group things together. So, you know, we've recently increased some of the work we're doing down in Dorchester and Roxbury because we had a, num a couple of agencies and a few more are interested. So we, we've grouped those things together. Um, but most of the, what we do is probably within five to 10 miles of our hub it, over on Summer Street. And it would seem for both operations, both Food Link and Black Earth, that there's probably an opportunistic sort of angle here, right? Like if someone asks you or if there's a, a ton of food in this area, you might consider standing up a new operations hub, uh, in, in your case, Justin, or serving a new area in your case. Like that's organic growth, right? That's sort of yeah. meeting things as they come up. Uh, and and John, at the state level, I wonder, what does the map look like to you? Do, you? do you know sort of, okay, I've got good food distribution in this part of the state and I've got great composting over here, but like, how do you look at it from, from 20,000 feet? Yeah, so and there was a, a question that, that came up in the chat that I can maybe address in this context too about the role of anaerobic digestion. So we have a lot of anaerobic digestion facilities, most of which are um, based on dairy farms and they co-digest um, manure with uh, food waste. We, we have 11 eight anaerobic digestion facilities overall, but most of those are in either the central or western part of the state. And so as we, and, and when you look at a map of food waste generation patterns, more of the food waste is in the Eastern part of the state as you might expect, because we have more population and more, and more businesses in the Eastern part of the state. So as we look ahead, uh, the, you know, one of the, the ways our capacity will, will need to evolve and shift a little bit is to, to develop more capacity in the eastern part of the state, which could either, you know, be more anaerobic digestion, more composting, or the other thing that started to develop is these intermediate processing facilities that kind of serve as transfer operations for food waste, where they'll take food waste in, uh, load it up, and then um, um, put it into a, a larger transfer vehicle and deliver it to a site in another part of the state. So, between those those different approaches, I think we're going to see the infrastructure continue to evolve to to meet um, you know to meet the generation that's that's going on you know certainly not exclusively there's a lot of food waste all over Massachusetts but um, you know a greater percentage of it is is in the eastern uh, third of the state. Great, thanks for that context. And I think you know in our pre call when we sort of we're, we're catching up around some of the big themes, you had mentioned that a lot of uh, food waste exits the state um, uh, because there is no capacity for it and it goes as far as the Midwest, you're saying. Yeah, so that would be in, in the, the, the food waste that's going into our trash. Um, so, 
you know, that 900,000 tons or so a year. Um, yeah. When you look at our, uh, when you look at our trash, we, we dispose of, when you're putting aside construction material, that's kind of a separate category. We dispose of around, um, between around four point, you know, four million, let's say four million tons a year of municipal solid waste. That's a regular household and business trash and um, in state. And then there are probably about another million tons or so a year out of state. And a lot of the waste that's going out of state is going pretty far by by rail haul as far as Ohio, South Carolina, Alabama, uh, places like that, uh, which is not, you know, not um where we want to see our trash going. We want to be, you know, managing the material more effectively locally, producing less trash and, you know, having, in the case of food waste, having it go to operations like Justin's and uh, uh, even before that to places like, you know, with uh, like Elise at Foodlink where we can capture the value of this material in state. Yeah, and obviously the the, if it ends up in a landfill, that's really bad from a greenhouse gas perspective if it's releasing methane and, and such. But it's also if you're going to transport it to another state to release it there, then you have all that transport costs um, uh, and, and greenhouse gas associated with that. It really is uh, uh, sort of a depressing picture. You mentioned that there's you've identified that there's about, I guess, a fifth, right? About 21 percent of the solid waste that goes into landfills is food scraps. How do you tell? I mean, is this pitchforks and and algorithms, or, or how are you able to, to know that? Yeah, so that's based on um, waste characterization that studies that are done at um, at a number of our facilities. It's our, our large waste combustors in particular that have a, a requirement to conduct those studies every three years. So we have, uh, where are we now, 20, 20, the last ones were, were held last year. So I think we have 22, 19, 20. I think we have 15 years of those studies now. Uh, five five sets of them, three years apart, and they have a, a methodology for doing. There, there's actually like an ASTM methodology for doing this. Um, that, that's like a statistically valid uh, way of sampling waste. They do a certain number of certain size samples across the waste stream, um, and um, you know come up with this um, calculation. That's kind of a, a what they call a waste character waste characterization it's a, a weight based weight characterization so they they do all these samples so it is, it is literally you know the sample they'll sort out every speck of that sample in a different they have like 60 different bins or 62 i think different bins that they sort it into and weigh all of it and then characterize that across the waste stream so it, it's pretty it, it's pretty good robust um you know big picture pretty accurate data and so we we feel like we have a pretty good handle on on our waste waste uh, you know characterization based on those reports and that data. And I think it's the weight and probably moisture content and all of that. I mean that that matters, right? Food scraps in in a trash bin are heavy. And and Justin, I think you know there's got to be a knock on effect if you're picking up for a municipality, for example, doing curbside pickup. Um, that is uh, um, a huge amount of weight that's being diverted uh, to the landfill, right? They're tipping fees that cities have to pay to, to get that stuff done. So um, do you have a sense of how much that might save a municipality to institute a program like this? Um, it varies on participation, um, but every account that signs up with us is reducing that tonnage by 10 pounds every week. Um, but I, I don't, I, I have access to that somewhere. Um, if you hear noise in the background, we actually have a truck dumping right now. Um, but that it's that's it's a huge incentive for towns to get involved um, is you know to to lower that total tipping fee, which is only going it's high already, um, and it's only going up. We have you know with uh, landfills uh, set to shut down in the next few years. Um, you want to take the heaviest portion of that. Tra of that what is currently being trashed I always air away from saying food scrap is trash if it's being composted um but really the, the, the more a town adopts it the, the more they're going to save on that trash fee uh that's uh it's awesome there's so many ways to look at this like we obviously don't want the waste and we don't want the greenhouse 
gas. We don't want the, the money waste. We don't want all the, the, the bad stuff, but there's a lot of good here. And I think we'll talk about that bef just before the end, but I wanna get to a few questions. And Elise, this one's for you asking sort of where you're recovering food from. And someone asked if there's, do you go to like Market Basket, for example, is it restaurants? I would imagine restaurants have a lot more prepared food, but they could have maybe a, an extra bushel of something. Like where, what are your main sources? Yeah, so our main sources are grocery stores. Um, we have partnerships with a number of Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, and Stop and Shops, um, as well as some smaller places. Um, we and Costco and Wegmans as well. Um, we don't currently work with Market Basket. I do think that they are donating some of their product to the Greater Boston Food Bank, but I'm not as familiar with their program. Um, we also work with wholesalers and a couple of local farms. Our farm work is much more around uh, collecting excess from farmers markets or from CSAs, as opposed to gleaning. Uh, the Boston Area Gleaners, which I'm sure a number of people are familiar with, do gleaning throughout the state. They do it really well, and we actually receive some of their excess periodically. If their truck is coming tomorrow to give us some stuff before the long weekend. Um, so we work with a number of other organizations, too, to kind of collaborate in that way. Uh, but grocery stores are our main part. Wholesalers are also really interesting. We've been working with uh, some produce vendors at the New England uh, produce market for a long time. Uh, and we do periodic pickups from various places like Little Leaf Lettuce has been a recent donor um, as they were getting their new greenhouse up and running and kind of building their market. Uh, locally for that new greenhouse, we were getting um, some big truckloads from them about once a week for a little bit. Hey, so uh, a diversified uh, stream of sources. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, wherever I did, calls us. We, we wherever go. Calls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I did see that there's some questions in the Q&A. Please, everybody, put them in the chat. I'm sorry, we're not able to, to monitor both. Uh, but I did see one of the Q&A, um, Justin, and this occurred to me as well. You're probably not getting a lot of like um, utensils and containers that say compostable on them, but may or may not be to the level that you need. Like, how is that a big problem in terms of, of the quality of what you're taking in? Uh, in a short answer, yes. <laughs> uh, it's a, but it's it's trending for the better. I'm I'm very optimistic about um, you know the overall adoption of compostable uh, um, plastics uh, bowls, etc. Um, but the label, like uh, ruling around labeling has to catch up to that. There's a lot of confusion of, uh, you know, the word com compost is unfortunately a loosely defined word, especially if you're trying to sell a product. Um, so we have a set of certifications that we accept, uh, BPI, CMA, and TUV. Those all ensure the full compostability within 180 days at our commercial facility, but it also man, it, it also uh, tests for levels of uh, forever chemicals, uh, the PFAS group of chemicals that may be present otherwise. And that's, yeah, sorry, that's a, a whole other, are you seeing an uptick in that? I mean, it's all over the news in terms of, of the levels that, that are being measured just across I'm 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 happy that this come this this came up tonight, but it is certainly worth a, a, you know another session on where our, our levels are trending very far, much downward, and we okay. test it specifically because we take that issue extremely uh, seriously. We're well below the straits threshold, and it is continuing to decline. The more that we clamp down on our feedstock, and the more awareness we spread about um, what proper uh, materials that we can and can't accept. Awesome, thank you. And I, there's actually a Black Earth customer in the, put a, something in the chat talking about your yay and nay list, things that oh, you yes. will accept and things that you won't accept. And uh, they're confident that they're doing the right thing, but what do you do? Like if there's, if there's a nay product in there? Uh, I, I always appreciate when people are looking into it and uh, instead of just guessing and hoping for the best, there's a, the wish, wish cycling translates to composting as well. Um, most coffee cups are not compostable, just for out there. Um, but what, so what do we do? We educate initially the, the restaurant, for example, or the resident will take a photo. That photo will be sent to you. This is not compostable. Um, we, uh, we do manual extraction. That's a technical term for the driver. Hopefully picks it out and puts it in the trash. If it makes it in the truck, it's trickier and trickier to remove it. We have a big screener that hopefully, you know, removes 
90%. And then we have a vacuum on the conveyor belt removes 5% and a blower 5%. And uh, we do the best we can, but uh, fruit stickers seem to be uh, rather evasive for us, but we do our best. Prevention is key. Absolutely. Prevention is key. Don't produce excess food in the first place and, and keep, keep the stuff out if it has to go in. Um, oh, thank you, Sarah, from our webinar team. Uh, put in your What's Compostable page, a link uh, in there. And so, you know, one thing we, we touched on briefly in the introduction, Elise, because I know we're, we're down about two and a half minutes left. So any last minute questions, throw them in here. If we weren't able to address them tonight, our, our team will follow up. Um, but we talked about the daily table, right? There's there's entire businesses, and I believe they just opened their fifth location, right? They're in, uh, or about to open their fifth. They're in Central Square, Mattapan, Dorchester. Um, thank you, Sarah, for that daily table link. And you know they're recovering food that might not be. It's the ugly fruit, right? It's the stuff that's perfectly fine to eat uh, and just might not uh, be appealing for a boutique grocery store, right? Uh, but still deserves uh, to be uh, on a plate at a good meal. Uh, we have a local option doing the same thing: Neighborhood Produce, which now has two uh, locations here in Somerville. And so uh, there's more of this out there. Check it out. Um, and I do just want to say, sort of on the legislative side, and the sort of uh, at the state level. Uh, city and state level, the city of Boston about a month ago, um, um, two counselors banded together. They've been studying food waste for about a year and a half and food insecurity and saying, this is a problem. How do we keep this food here? Uh, and have sponsored um, uh, a city ordinance uh, that is working its way through the council now. And there's two dozen bills at least dealing with waste and at least three or four of those are dealing with food waste specifically in the current legislative session. Um, and so come out to our Zero Waste Arlington uh, meetings. We're talking about all that stuff. We're getting involved. Um, we want to know what you care about, uh, and we can be your advocates up on the Hill. And it looks like we're about a minute. Um, I'd like to get closing uh, comments from anybody um, who would like to uh, to offer any. We're so grateful that you've uh, come to give your, your expertise tonight and share your time with us. And feel free to just jump in. I would just say real quick that, you know, I know we didn't get to all the questions. So if, if you guys want to follow up with me on any of the questions that relate to me afterwards, happy to talk further and get people answers about those. I'm, I'm more and more, more and more optimistic about for, uh, you know, being in Massachusetts and having legislature and groups like this behind uh, our mission. Um, we're, we're getting there. It's a little hairy right now, but uh, we're certainly on the right path. And I'll just add that I think, you know, the exciting thing to me about food waste is that it's a doable solution. Um, you know, this is something that we can affect change in our own lives on. And we do need legislative and big systems changes to like make it lasting, but it's something you can be talking to your neighbors about. You can be changing the way to eat. Um, I was really excited this evening to go through the participant list and see so many food link volunteers on here. Uh, so there's plenty of ways to get involved, whether you volunteer with us or get a subscription with Black Earth. It's something you can do something about, which is not always the case when it comes to issues around our climate. And our collective action will move markets. Um, be the change, uh, lead by example. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'll follow up with everybody with effusive thank yous uh, after this, but I would like to give you the rest of your evening back. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Just a reminder, we are meeting a week from tonight is the next Zero Waste Arlington um, committee meeting uh, and zerowastearlington.org. Uh, you can find all of our resources that we talked about before. It's a great website. I want to thank our website team uh, who's just rocking it right now. So thank you all. Have a great night. Enjoy the uh, uh, unseasonable weather.